So Last Epoch is finally coming out on the 21st of February. And with the release come different types of players and different types of people. Some people want to jump into Last Epoch blind and some of them want to get a little bit of experience before, kind of know how the very basics of the game work. Now, for people who want to go in completely blind, I will say this. You do not have to watch this video in order to enjoy Last Epoch. I think it is one of the most friendly ARPGs when it comes to diving in blind, picking a random skill and just kind of blasting with it. However, how far you will go will definitely depend on how much knowledge you have in the game and how much you know about builds, because there's always going to be skills that are stronger. You can always have an edge by having more knowledge than other people, knowing where to farm, knowing what to do and what not to do. And that is what I want to provide with this video. I kind of want to give you a baseline to build upon so you don't have to think about every small thing whenever you launch the game for the first time. Since this will be a longer video, I will also put very aggressive timestamps both in the description and in the top comment that I will pin so that if you don't want to watch for like an hour long video, you can just exactly pinpoint what you want to know more about. Also, if you want to chat with me or just hang out with like many people, I'm over on Twitch on twitch.tv slash palstrom. So yeah, you can also go there to ask me further stuff. I will be streaming quite a bit, especially on release and then every cycle. So every RPG starts here at the character selection screen. And while uh, I've seen some people giving their thoughts in their beginner guides about what is good and what isn't good, I don't know whenever you're watching this and a single patch can completely change the landscape. What I will say about the class dynamic and the class balance is Last Epoch is very much on top, so you never feel bad about picking a class. So unless you're trying to push the very top of the leaderboards, there is no reason for you to get freaked out about what class to pick. If you like the look of the mage, if you like the look of the rogue, that is totally fine and you're going to do well. With that said, let's jump into the classes, starting out with the Sentinel. So the way classes work is you pick your class at the start, obviously your name, you have your skills, you can kind of hover over them and see what they do. And then there are free subclasses called Masteries. What Masteries do is they specialize your character. So for example, we're going to go over this later. But if I choose the Void Knight Mastery, that means that I can pick from the whole Void Mastery passive skill tree, whereas on all the others, I am locked after the first half. So I can still splash into those other specializations. For example, I'd say I want that physical rest. I can still take the first few points, but I cannot get some of these more specialized things at the end. Every mastery also comes with a special passive bonus. So for example, here for the Forge Guard, it would be physical and fire resistance and then increased armor for each hit you've taken. Or for the Void Knight, you have something a little bit more fancy that basically makes it so you can actually copy your skills as an example right here. You can kind of echo your skills and they are kind of in place. So if you, for example, a Cyclone build, you can make copies of yourself that are whirling around. Every mastery also has a skill that you can only play if you chose that mastery. So for example, a Raising Strike would be the one on Void Knight. I'm not really using it. Some of them are better than others. Obviously still depends on balance. For example, as a Paladin, you get something very strong, which is just a Holy Aura. And then on Forge Guard, you would get something like a Forge Strike. These are highly specific. These are not the only specialized things that you can get because if you see at the end of these trees, there's also other skills locked behind. It depends on the class. Important to note here, you can actually not change your subclass at all. So round about level 15, you will be asked to choose Void Knight, Forge Guard, and Paladin, for example, on the Sentinel. And after that, you cannot undo it. You will have to completely re-level. So this is actually a very important step. You will be able to undo everything else, skills, passes, right? All those small things, but these decisions do actually matter. So now let's talk about the classes themselves. First, we have the Sentinel. This is sort of your melee type character, sword and board, big two-hander, whirling around, stuff like that. But you can also go into more of a mage route with the Void Knight. It can be melee, it can be mage. It's more focused around Void, which is one of these sort of like chaos type elements. You have the Forge Guard, which is a little bit more focused on summoning weapons and armors and kind of manifesting them and them fighting for you. And then we have the Paladin, which is sort of your Holy Warrior type with healing, being very tanky, having extremely strong auras, also very strong for group play. Next up, we have the Rogue, which is sort of your assassin -y type character, but there is a little bit more to it. So the subclasses of the Rogue are first up the Blade Dancer. That is literally the kind of assassin. It is dancing around the screen. It's extremely fast. It has a lot of dashes. Then we have the Marksman, which is your typical ranger style character. You have detonating arrow, hail of arrows, a lot of these kind of builds. You're going to be probably a little bit more squishy and more ranged. And then at the end, we have the Falconer, which is currently not released, but it's going to be this Falcon hybrid build where you have this pet that's swirling around you. 
that you can customize as you wish. You can only have it as utility. You can have it be your only damage dealer. You can sort of be hybrid. Definitely a great class to look out for. Then we have in the middle here, the mage with its first subclass, the sorcerer, your typical elemental caster. Then we have the spell blade, which is your hybrid mage, sort of your battle mage, where you can be melee, you can be spells, you can have melee skills that proc other spells. Then at the end, we have the rune master, which is a little bit different than sorcerer in the sense that it has these runes that can conjure up certain spells. The world is kind of your oyster. There's a lot of spells to choose from, and it is a little bit more complicated. Then we have the primalist, which is going to be your big burly guy. First, we have the beast master, which has sort of these beast companions. For example, you can have a scorpion, you can have a bunch of wolves, squirrels, whatever you want. We then have the shaman, which is once again about elemental magic it's also a lot about totems and having other things deal damage for you and the druid is all about shape shifting and for example it's the only class that gets werebear form and then last but not least we have the acolyte with its first subclass the necromancer which is as you might already have figured out all about minions making your minions stronger sacrificing them to proc even stronger minions buffing them all of that after that we have the lich which revolves around the reaper form so you basically become a reaper it has a lot to do with stuff like poison damage and damage over time and at the end here a class that's going to be added with 1.0 is going to be the warlock which is sort of your damage over time casters a lot of flashy effects it sort of revolves around fire and necrotic magic next up let's talk about the passive skill trees every time you level up you get one point that you can allocate wherever you want and you get certain passive bonuses so that might be damage that might be defense it might be more fancy stuff down the road there are four different skill trees for every class so for example we picked the sentinel right here which is our main sentinel trees up here these are just very basic stats that you can use on every single mastery as much as you want and once you reach 20 points into this tree right here, you will unlock the ability to put points into one of the specialized trees. One of the masteries you have actually mastered, and it will tell you right under it. For me, this is, for example, the Void Knight. I will get all the bonuses that it says here on the side, plus I will get the skill. What this will also let me do is I'm able to spec into the whole passive tree until the very end. Usually, front loaded are very basic buffs, and then later you will see a lot more specialized and more powerful points however you can still put points into the other trees if you want to but only up to the halfway point the specialized nodes down here you actually cannot access so there's that but you can still access some of the skills from other masteries now the way you access skills is actually by putting points into certain trees so for example some skills you will just get normally we're going to talk about that in a second and some other skills well you have to unlock it so for example, at level 5, if you put 5 points here, you will get Rebuke. If you put 10 points in, you get Shield Rush, 15 Multi-Strike, 20 Smite. Everybody gets that because you need to put the first 20 points into the first skill tree in order to unlock your Masteries. However, let's say, for example, I'm a Void Knight. I don't need to put any points into the Paladin tree. But let's say I want Healing Hand or Sigils of Hope. Now we'll have to put 5 points in to get to Healing Hand. So, for example, let's do it right here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And you will see at 5 skill unlocked healing hand same is true for stuff like sigils of hope other than that i guess important are these dots you see sometimes the connections between these passives this one dot basically if you hover over it already tells you just means that it requires one point in the node before in order to spec anything to this point obviously you still have to get to this but for example here it also says requires one point if i put one point here all of a sudden it lights up and now i can put however many points I want to put in here there's also more requirements for example if you hover over here this one would require me at least five points to even spec into holy nova now next up we have the skill system first up these skills up here are available to every single character same with these down below these are just unlocked for levels so you get them at level two level four level six level eight and so on up until level 20 i think is void cleave and then with putting points into the passive trees you're going to unlock these so everything on the left side here doesn't matter whether you're a forge guard doesn't matter whether you're a void knight you're always going to get them all the skills on the right side are more specialized some you can still get so for example i can still get volatile reversal even if i was a paladin because in order to get volatile reversal i would just need to put five points into this tree right here and i would get it however some of the other ones for example are later than the halfway mark so if i wasn't the void knight i wouldn't be able to even get here so i would never get anomaly as well as that i would not be getting the mastery specific skill for example a raising strike so some of these skills are actually hidden behind certain classes now 
you can have whatever skills you want down here. You can only have five in total on your bar that you use at any time. However, you can also specialize five skills. Now, what does that mean? So every skill comes with a unique passive skill tree that you can put points into. It goes from level one to level 20. If you have certain items, you can even go higher than level 20, but that is usually your baseline. Now, what do these points do? So you, you start out in the middle at your main skill and then you can customize it. So you can kind of see this as sort of like support gems in Path of Exile. You can kind of make your own skill as you want to, but it is a lot more interesting because there's also stuff like keystones that completely change how your character or your skill works. Now, these special nodes are usually outlined a little bit different, as you can see right here, than some of the other nodes. This node right here just gives you a little bit of extra damage. This node looks a lot more fancier, so this will actually change the way you play. So for example, this is the build defining node for what i'm playing right now which is the echo warpath build your warpath now echoes and leaves behind copies of yourself so as you can see right here if i'm whirling around after a certain duration it starts actually leaving echoes behind that deals more and more damage however i could have also built around something else i could have said well i kind of want to go into summon forged weapons so now whenever you spin you're gonna summon weapons that fight for you over time and your cyclone is sort of more like utility or you can just say, I want AoE. Here, I splashed in a little bit of movement speed because I have the points left. I can go into damage. I can go into leech. I can get mana sustain. For example, here, I chose minus to mana cost. So it's more sustainable and I don't ever have to stop spinning. So while we cannot go into every node, obviously, just know that there's a lot of different ways to play every single skill in the game. They actually put a lot of work into making it as customizable as possible. Now, the way you get these skill points is by farming xp so for example whenever you kill monsters you get experience up here so it says level 10 hammer throw uh, accelerated xp gain until level 20 so for example if you're higher level and you're now respecking you're going to be starting at level 10 instead of level 20 but you get accelerated xp so it's going to be faster to get back to 20 so if you see this for example let's say i have lunge right here which is my movement skill i can say respec up here now what you can do is you can just remove certain points so for example i say remove i don't want to stop away anymore respec one point okay now i can stop respecting now i'm only level 19 this doesn't mean i can actually allocate the point again it just means now i have to form up the experience and then i can reallocate it. and if i don't want this skill at all anymore i click respec and i say despecialized skill so now, are you sure? Despecialized, now you will see there is a open slot. And now I can, for example, say, I would rather have Shield Bash right here. What you will note here is that it will already start with some points. It doesn't start out at one. And that is because the higher level you go, character level you go, the more minimum level you will actually gain for your skills. So it's easier in endgame to re-level them. Now, in these skill trees, you will see the same thing as in the passive trees. If you hover over here, there's going to be these dots, which are going to tell you how many points in the node before you need to go further. So for example, here it says requires two points. So if I put one point in, it doesn't let me put anything in here. If I put a second one, all of a sudden it's open. Here one point, then I can go here and so on. Now important to know though, is that just because you specialized into a skill doesn't necessarily mean you have to put it on your bar. Sometimes skills will trigger other skills. In this case, for example, I have shift, which is my movement skill right here. This is how it looks like. And you can see that whenever I shift, I actually get these shurikens. And that's because there is a node right here that says I get shurikens whenever I shift. So what that means is I want to specialize shuriken. So for example, here I say that it actually swirls around me and then it gives me an armor buff. However, that doesn't mean I have to put it on my bar. So what happens right here is I'm using a specialization slot, but now I can put something else on my bar because... I have five specializations, I have five skills down here, but I don't need to use it directly. So now what you can use is, for example, a lot of people do this, they just use a decoy. Decoy doesn't necessarily need their tree to be good, it taunts enemies, right? So while you cannot specialize it, you can still use it. All right, so first up, I have to explain the character menu right here and what all these stats mean. If you press C, you can open this. It will tell you my level, my experience, yada, yada, yada. First up, there are five different attributes. Strength, Dexterity, Intelligence, Attunement, and Vitality. Now, these give you certain buffs. For example, strength is 4% armor. Dexterity gives you plus 4 dodge each. And you can increase those. And not only do they give you whatever they say on here, they will also increase certain skills damage. So for example, if you go to the skill right here, which is called Dancing Strikes, you can hover over it. And at the bottom, Scaling Tags, it will tell you exactly what it is. And it will say Dexterity. And if you then press Alt, it will say Dexterity Scaling. 4% per point, which means every dexterity you have will increase the damage of this by 4%. So yeah, not only do you need to look out for what you actually want for your character, you also need to think about 
does that stat actually make sense for my build? Then have health, mana, mana region. Mana region normally starts at 8 and you can increase it with percentages. You cannot increase, at least as of this video, the base mana regeneration. So if you get 100% mana region, you go from 8 to 16. You cannot get like 10 and then go from 10 to 20 or something like that. It's not like in PoE with, for example, clarity or something. Then you have seven different types of resistances. Now, if an item says elemental resistances, that includes fire, lightning, and cold, and everything else is just kind of going to be singled out. Important to know is you do not need to be capped technically. There are builds that are actually not capped because they have better defensive capabilities at some point, but most builds will be. The reason some builds will not be is because it's not like in PoE. So for example, in PoE, if you have zero res versus 75 res, that is like you're four times as tanky against that element. In this game, it works different because enemies have penetration. You then have your block chance and block basically has a certain amount of chance. And then when you block, your block effectiveness will determine how much damage you actually reduce. So for example, if I have zero block effectiveness, block means nothing. I also need to scale block effectiveness, which you will get from shield and from certain masteries. Then we have armor, which armor you can find on any body armor. So everybody will have a little bit amount of, some go a little bit deeper with percentage armor in the tree and whatnot. What this does is it reduces all damage taken from hits for physical damage, it takes 100% of your armor value and reduces that damage. For non-physical damage, it only takes 70% of that effectiveness. So very good against physical damage, still quite good against anything else. We have dodge. This is basically just a chance to completely avoid an attack. Same with stun avoidance, pretty self-explanatory. And then we have ward retention. The way ward works in this game is it's sort of like energy shield in Power of Exile. It will protect your life but it will trickle down. So it won't regen. It will actually have to be first gained and then have to be kept there. So for example, if I had a skill that would give me 100 ward, it would give me 100 and then trickle down 100, 90, 80, 60. So it's like kind of like a temporary buffer and not like energy shield. And what this mod right here, ward retention does, is it makes it so the ward stays longer. It trickles down slower so you can actually use it for defenses. We then have a rundown of all your damage stats down here. The only important thing to know here, these are pretty cookie cutter. It's just whatever you spec into. Important thing to know, if you hover over critical strike chance, the base critical strike chance of everything that isn't like connected to your weapon directly is five. So your weapon might say plus four critical strike chance, then it is five plus four because five is the baseline for every spell for everything in the game. So that's that. But then if we go into defense, we see a few more things right here. First up, I want to talk about critical strike avoidance, which is not optional like it is, for example, in Path of Exile. You can also have reduced damage from critical strikes, which kind of does the same, but it's a lot more, I guess, reliable, but also a little bit harder to get. You need some ways to mitigate crits because in endgame monoliths, there will be a lot of crits flying around. If you're not, you're going to die. So just so you know that, already look for that on itemization at some point. Endurance is a little bit more complicated, but if you hover over, Last Epoch actually gives you an example right here. So what that means is, Let's say you have 50% endurance from wherever. You can get it on gear. You can get it from the passive tree. That means that at a certain threshold, you're going to reduce 50% of the incoming damage. So you're going to have it. Now, that depends on your endurance threshold though. So for example, if you have 100 endurance threshold, the last 100 HP of these 530 is the ones that gets affected by your endurance. So for example, if my endurance threshold was actually 530, which is the amount of HP I have right now, all my damage would be reduced by for example, 50%. The cap for endurance is 60%, so you can reduce more than 60% of your damage, but this is kind of how it works. Glancing blow is basically just a chance to reduce the damage taken by 35%. So if you have 100% of this, you just permanently take 35% less damage. Ward decay threshold basically just means if you have a thousand ward decay threshold, it cannot go below a thousand ward. You will never trickle down below that point. Next up, let's talk about itemization. Items in this game are pretty damn hype, so I want to give you the full round down here. If we, for example, look at this boiled leather right here, where it starts is on the top. It has a certain amount of armor, or if you have a weapon, it has a certain amount of damage, or if it's a caster weapon, it has a certain amount of spell damage. It also has some other specializations like damage for totems, damage over time, yada, yada, yada. Important to note before we even get to the mods on the item, these implicits up top are actually super important. Some of the best implicits will be so much stronger than some of the weakest ones. You can have like the best mods down here, for example, ward gain on use with smoke bomb, crit chances and whatnot. It doesn't matter if the base type sucks, the item will also suck. But down here we see armor, endurance, which is a certain defensive 
type that we're going to go over later. We have forging potential, which is something for crafting. Also going to talk about it. And then we have these mods right here. Now, there are prefixes and suffixes in this game. Usually prefixes are more offensive and suffixes are more defensive, but that is not always true. It depends, but usually stuff like resistances and health and stuff like that and armor are going to be suffixes, whereas uh, more specific damage modifiers are going to be prefixes. For example, here, the crit chance with flurry. The way you can see what is a prefix and what is a suffix is actually these notches on the side right here. This will tell you it's a prefix, prefix, suffix, suffix. You will also note that if I throw something down on the ground, it will have these dots next to it, which will sort of say, this item has two prefixes and one suffix. Now, there are six different rarities in Last Epoch. First, we have normal items. Normal items in this game don't really have any use case whatsoever. It's not like Path of Exile where you're just going to craft an item from scratch. You have very low forging potential. You don't really have any items to go off of. So it's just very bad. You use it for the first few levels. It doesn't really have anything. However, magic items actually do have a purpose, and we're going to go over that once we get into crafting. But magic items are basically just, they have one to two modifiers, and that's that. You can craft them to rares and whatnot. That's all good. Rares drop with three or four modifiers, and it's always going to be a maximum of two prefixes, two suffixes on magic item, one prefix, one suffix. Then we have exalted items. These are basically super strong rare items that have at least one mod that goes over tiers. So here we can talk about tiers for a second. If I control alt right here you can see the tiers of the modifiers so for example my prefix are both tier one and the suffix is tier four the higher tier the better it's not like in path of exile it's the other way around now if you look at this item this purple mod down below the minion spell damage is incredibly high that is because it's actually higher than tier five which is the highest that you can craft drop only it says next to the tier six down below so these go a lot higher and the point here is that you will basically have to find these items. You can't just craft them to perfect, which would be tier seven, which is the highest tier that you can drop. So no, for the strongest items, you will not be able to just craft them. So for example, let's say you drop this. Sure, you can craft all of these up to tier five, more on that later, but you will never be able to get the same power as the same item that already comes with an exalted modifier. So the game has this interesting balance of you actually playing the game and then crafting instead of just you sitting in the, your hideout all day. Uh, then let's talk about uniques. These are your typical build around items or just really strong chase items that you have throughout the whole game. But there's quite a bit more to it because they also come with a certain amount of legendary potential. So every unique comes with the same stats, basically. Some of them have like weird interactions, but usually they come with the same stats. They have roll ranges. So for example, this health right here, it says 65 to 145. I rolled a 105. It is not possible to reroll these whatsoever on uniques. Just so you know, it is possible on rares and exalted items. But what changes is up top, you will see legendary potential. Now, what you can do with this potential is there is a certain end game boss that if you beat them, you can combine an exalted item with a unique item. And out comes, ta-da, a legendary item. So the purple mods on top used to be on an exalted item that I combined with this normal tome of elements. What these are, are basically an amount of mods equal to the legendary potential. So for example, this one said two legendary potential. If I now took, for example, this exalted item and slammed it on to this Iron's Wisdom, I have a completely random chance to take two mods, completely random, off of this full plate and put it on the Iron's Wisdom. Important to know is that you cannot just have like a two stat item and then those are exactly going to be chosen. They have to have four mods, so there is going to be RNG involved. Now, legendary potential can go from one to four. And in order to make you understand just how rare it is to get four LP, which if you had four LP, theoretically, I would get all the mods from this item directly on the Iron's Wisdom. And you have to remember, you can craft these items before and so on and so on. But just to make you understand, whenever you drop this body armor, you have a 0.019% chance for it to have four legendary potential. Now, not every unique is made equally. So for example, it says here, effective level for legendary potential. The lower this number, the more chance you actually have to get more LP. The higher this number, the more it is absolutely impossible to ever get to 4 or 3 LP. Now, Iron's Wisdom is a pretty basic item. It's also level 27. But if we, for example, took 
Herald of the Scurry right here, which is an incredible end game item that you need to be level 76 to even wear. You will see right here, the calculations are completely different. Even getting one LP on it is already a 1 in 10 chance. And if we go down here, <laughs> it's basically impossible to ever get 4 LP. Now, why is this so interesting? This, this like level of legendary potential. It's interesting because they can make it so that early game items like that Iron Wisdom I just showed you, which fall off in endgame, right? They have to compete with other body armors, which are way better. They can make them have more legendary potential to kind of make up for that. Because Iron's Wisdom, nobody's going to use this. Even on two legendary potential, it cannot really compete with most of the body armors. If we're talking four legendary potential, if you have a really good item to combine it with, now we're talking. But this leads me right into crafting, which is actually very approachable. If you don't like crafting, for example, in Path of Exile, if it's too complicated, it isn't in Last Epoch. It is quite intuitive. So in order to open the crafting menu, you have to press F, which is hopefully not a precursor for what's about to come. And then you come into this forge menu. The first number you want to look at when you want to craft an item is the forging potential. Depending on what you want to do with the item, it might get really hard and you might need a lot of forging potential. Once you have zero on this potential, you cannot further craft this item in any way, shape, or form. It's basically like the item getting corrupted, but you actually can't interact with it anymore. Not even with like special currency or anything like that. Now, what do we do with that crafting potential? We can actually upgrade all the mods that are on this item, but there is more to it. Now, how do you upgrade these items? This is basically with your crafting materials. You will find these all over the world. You will pick them up and it will say like dexterity shard or something. And or let's say poison resistance shard right here. I can view my materials and I can type in poison red. And you can see right here, poison resistance. I've been playing quite a while. I have like 1,700 of these. So I could upgrade a poison resistance mod like 100 times or whatever. But those are really, really common. When we talk about stuff like levels to certain skills, you will see I have a lot less. So for example, if I've had hail of arrows build, I could only upgrade it four times. So I might have to farm for it or... I might have to settle on tier four. But if you need these shards, you can actually get them from shattering items. And this is where, for example, magic items come in. So this item will never be anything, right? You will never care about this item at all. It has like no forging potential. It only has two mods. They're all low level. But what they can provide you with is shards. Because if you use a rune of shattering right here, destroy an item, creating a random number of affix shards containing its power. You click on it and then you do shatter. And now you're getting a random amount of these two modifiers to your shard collection. And these shards can now be applied to, for example, other items. Now, once we have these shards figured out, so those are basically those shards that you can find, we have to talk about upgrading. So whenever you want to upgrade something, for example, I want to upgrade from tier 4 to tier 5. It will tell you down here, the cost is 1 to 24 forging potential, which is completely random. So it might use up all your forging potential or it might use up only one. There are ways to influence this though, and that is through glyphs. For example, the golden standard is the Glyph of Hope. It gives you a 1 in 4 chance, 25%, that nothing happens to your forging potential. So if you get lucky by that, that's great. So for example, we put that in right here. And we want to upgrade the increased crit chance with Flurry. Let's see if we get lucky. Upgrade Affix, forging potential 16. It went down to 7. We didn't hit the 1 in 4. But you could hit it theoretically. You find a lot of these. You don't have to use them sparingly at all. Next up, we have more Glyphs here, though, that you can use. This one's a little bit more fancy. It's the Glyph of Chaos. What this will do is completely reroll a mod to a different one. So it could use up whatever, 1 to 12 forging potential. The higher this tier goes, so for example, if you see, if I want to upgrade the Poison Res, it's 1 to 24. If I just want to upgrade from tier 2 to tier 3, it only uses 1 to 12. So it goes higher and higher and higher and gets riskier and riskier. So usually you want to do the higher mods kind of at the end. But yeah, if I want to change this crit chance with Flurry, I can, for example, say Glyph of Chaos, upgrade and reroll and we got this, a critical success right here, which is actually a good point to talk about. Critical successes. You saw that my level of shift just went up by one, even though I didn't even do anything. There is a very small chance. I don't think it's very small. It's around about 10%-ish. Somebody can tell me in the comments, actually, if there is an exact number already on that. You can upgrade other mods while upgrading the mod you want. That is very random, though. You shouldn't really bank on it, but it is a nice extra. But as you can see right here, it is now increased damage per arrow with multi-shot. So we completely changed that mod. Pretty good. We also have the Glyph of Order, which is a little bit more specific, but nonetheless very strong. So you can see every mod has a range. For example, this plus one to shift, plus 20 to mana. It rose from 19 to 24. Let's say this was 24 and it was perfect. If I upgraded it, it would re-roll again. So it could be the worst of that new tier. But if you apply 
glyph of order and it was perfect before it stays perfect now next up let's talk about the end game glyph that will make some of the craziest items in the game the glyph of despair this lets you lock an affix and basically remove it from the item so we will have a five stat item so let's say for example this freeze rate multiplier right here 107%. You could upgrade it, but you're like, ah, eh, either I don't need it and I want to free this up because I really want the rest of the item, or it's like 107 freeze rate multiplier is very strong on its own. That's fine. I just want to free up a slot. What you can do right here is choose the Glyph of Despair, then upgrade right here. And what it will do is now it has a chance to free up that slot. Now, the chance to actually get the upgrade, this is not 100% that you can actually do that. The chance relies on how big the tier here is. On a tier one, if you have four mods, it will always hit and imprint the mod. But if this was already a tier three, the chances get lower and lower and lower. But yeah, this item right here, it is a tier one mod. You have a 100% chance with the glyph to imprint it. Now it says sealed freeze rate multiplier at tier one. And you will see that it's kind of like gray on the bottom. And it just freed up another slot. So now I'm basically free to put in whatever suffix I want here and have a five stat item. So let's, for example, say chance to blind on hit. Let's craft it on real quickly. Five stat item. Now, on top of the glyphs, we also have runes. So the first one I already talked about, Rune of Shattering. This is how you acquire shards. Important to know, though, is there's also the Rune of Removal, which removes a random affix from item, like an Orb of a Null in PoE. Important to know here, this is not just good for crafting. It's also good for getting shards because you can randomly get unlucky. Let's say we have this four stat item and I wanted to shatter it. There's a chance I don't even get any damage while channeling shards. It's random. However, if I use a rune of removal and I exactly hit that mod, I will actually get the shards and I will get exactly as many as the tier is. So for example, with a tier two right here, if I did rune of removal, I will get exactly two. So just as a showcase right here, I will do that. Rune of removal, remove an affix. Let's see what I hit. I hit the melee critical strike chance, which was a tier two. So you get plus two shards on that. This is especially potent on magic items that only have one or two mods where you're very likely to actually hit it. But my forging potential is not over. I could try this again, right? I'll do it again. Okay, this time we had chance to blind. Hey, we hit the chance to blind. And now we get one on that. We can remove another affix plus two. And this tier six right here will give me six shards on top. Going further down the line, we have the rune of refinement, which basically rerolls the values of items. So if I, for example, took this item right here, all that values really means is within that tier. So we talked about the mana 19 to 24. I put on a rune of refinement and that will now re-roll it. But just so you know, it takes forging potential. So this is something most people will not be able to do because you first have to finish your item, which is already very hard to do. And then you re-roll. So you can usually only do this if you're very lucky. So we reforge. And uh, yeah, it didn't really change the mana, but it did change the poison resistance. After that, we have the Rune of Discovery, which is a great, great, great item, especially for early game. So if you look at Rune of Discovery, this basically fills an item with random tier one affixes. This is pretty good early if it doesn't matter. Any mod is good for you, right? Or you have like a good base with no modifiers on, just a normal item. Add four random modifiers. Boom. There you go. Completely random. Not all that usable for end game. There are certain edge cases though where it's actually good. Then we have the Rune of Shaping, which rerolls the implicits of an item. So it doesn't change the implicits. So for example, what would have a roll right here? This one says melee damage, spell damage. The spell damage has a roll from 39 to 47. It basically rerolls that. After that, we have the Rune of Ascendance, which is a very interesting one. This basically takes an item type and transforms it into a random unique item. Now, it is going to be exactly the same base type, so it is going to be a quiver, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be exactly this far wood quiver. It could be any quiver. So if we use this, for example, we're getting a sanguine horde, which is a nomad quiver. This rune is a really good way to get your early uniques. However, it is obviously very random, and there is a lot of quivers and any type that you want to farm. And at the end here, we have a rune of creation, which is kind of like a mirror of Calandra and Path of Exile. However, what you have to know is in order to do that, your original item, to mirror it, has to have still forging potential. So once again, you have to finish your item, then maybe even like roll the ranges and then still have something left over for the rune of creation. This is sometimes used for rings, especially because obviously you can use two, sometimes for weapons, but it isn't as applicable as it is in Path of Exile, obviously. Maybe this is going to change with trade being introduced. In general, these are very rare the rarest in general but yeah now next up let's talk about idols you might have seen on the right side here there is a weird menu 
where items fit in. That is for idols. These are basically itemized things like charms in D2 that uh, give you permanent bonuses as long as they are in this idol inventory. Now, these can range from extremely basic to build defining. For example, basic would be these idols right here. These uh, Eteran idols, Lagonian idols. They just give you general stats, lightning damage, health, resistances, poison chance, all of that jazz. They are usually the smaller ones that you can kind of cram in in some of the edges here. But the real big ones, for example, since I'm on Rogue right now, are these right here. So for example, this one right here is build defining for ballista builds because it gives you a lot of flat damage to ballistas. So these adorned and Majasan idols and shadow idols and whatnot, they will specifically call out certain skills that you're using and buff only them. But as a payoff, they're a lot stronger in what they do. So it lets you specialize in certain things. Now, obviously, the room here is a consideration. So while you could in four adorned idols right here, let's for example say one, two, three, four. Do note that now you only have space for four one by one. So that is a little bit weird, right? So you can put four in here. On the other hand, though, if you have some of the bigger ones, you can, for example, only fit in two of these because the only space you can really fit them in is exactly here and here, right? And now you have a kind of a weird Tetris problem because now you can't fit any of these in. So it's just something to think about whenever you plan out your character. Just know that you can't just cram in as many of them as you want. Now, fitting into this whole item crafting section right here would be the loot filter, which is actually in-game in last epoch so right here you can see in the options menu manage loot filters create a filter now you can also import filters if you have a paste bin or something you can even just like copy paste stuff from certain websites like max roll and paste clipboard contents and it will show the whole filter right here but if you want to create your own new filter what you can do right here is you can apply certain rules i will link you a full loot filter guide down below in the description if you really care about this a lot all you need to know it is very important to have a good loot filter in this game because everything drops identified this is why the crafting system and the item hunt works so well because you will see this on the ground and it's not even going to show up for example you're just looking for high tier attunement if it didn't have it, it would just not show. So it's a lot easier to distinguish and it's a lot easier to pick up stuff and then craft it. The one thing everybody should do though, even if you don't want to go into it too deep, is you should add a rule where basically on the side here, you can do show, hide, recolor. You can hide, by the way, if you press recolor, it automatically shows these items. But let's just say I want to hide. And up, click here, I can do affix, class requirement, level, rarity. We're going to do rarity, and then we're going to type in normal items. Nobody needs those at all. And we're also going to say magic items. In endgame, you can still put magic items on the filter later, but let's just say baseline, we're going to hide them all. However, as we talked about earlier, magic items could still be useful because they have a certain mod that you can then shatter, and then you get shards, and you can craft it on your endgame exalted item. So how do we do that? Well, the way these rules work is... The higher they are, the more priority they have. So for example, if I put a rule on top that says, let's say I need a certain affix. And let's say, just for example, that's going to be spell damage. I really want that spell damage mod. I can say spell confirm. You can also search it up here, any mod that you want from anywhere. Confirm, it's going to say spell damage with at least one of these affixes. Doesn't really matter. I can also go to advanced options right here and say, for example, I want this tier to be more than one. So it would only choose tier two or higher of spell damage. It would only show, let's say tier two, it would only show three or higher and so forth. For complexity sake, let's just say anything with spell damage on it. If I add that, now that is on top, it has higher weighting than this rule right here. So if I drop a magic item with spell damage, it would still show. So we're hiding all the trash and then we can still reintroduce certain mods on these trash items that we want though. And later in the game, what you're going to do is you're going to also include rare items because the rare items that you want, you can just put into another rule up top. Now then let's talk about NPCs. You have your normal vendor right here. You can go to shop and you can see right here, it has certain items. But what you will notice is they have a rune of shatterings and these are very important. They cost 2000 gold each, which is a resource that you're going to find across the world. So they are quite expensive at the start, but they are definitely super important. And vendors are a way to get them. They reset every so often. I actually don't know exactly how they reset. But yeah, you buy them, transfer crafting items. They're going to be soaked up in here. And that is how you can get more shards. Then as a second NPC, we have the gambler over here. 
This one gives you a random item of exactly the base that you buy. You cannot, however, get unique items. It used to be a thing. It's not really a thing anymore. So what you get is a normal magic or rare item. Let's buy this pickaxe and see what happens. It is a magic item. This can be really nice for like mid game and early game to kind of get specific things that you want to. It's not great. It is very neutered from what it was in the past. Still nice to know, especially early level. Do note though that the price will range on how good the base is especially excess water right here. Yeah, some of the rings are just incredibly pricey. Down here, you have the crafting bench. You never actually need to go there though, because you can just press F and just open it at any point. You can even do this while you're in a map. And up here, you have the chronomancer, which is going to let you respec certain points. And let's talk about the stash next. I'm kind of going to double this with the inventory. First up, you have a sort button right here. There's all your items, all your idols, and you can sort it and it's going to sort it. It's, a, it's an auto sort function. You have the same down here, sort and everything sorted. When it comes to stash ups, you start out with one. You can have different folders. And the reason I have so many is not because I paid cash, like in Power of Exile, for example. It's because you can actually buy these with gold. They don't have a fixed price. The price goes up. The more stash ups you buy, the more expensive it gets. For example, the first one costs a thousand. And if I wanted to, actually, that is the wrong button. Uh, if I wanted to add another one here at the end, I'm already at 670,000. So that is how many stash tabs I've already bought. But for hoarders in general, this is an incredible system. Important to note, let's say, for example, we wanted to find this item right here, Eye of Orexia, and we're just in another tab. You can click Quick Queue right here, and we type in Eye of Orexia. And now it's only going to show the tabs where that item is in there. So even if you have a ton of stash tabs, like 100 plus, you can still find everything you need. Now, then let's talk about end game systems. First up is the monoliths. So whenever you get to the end of time, at the end of the campaign, you can also go earlier, but that will change probably. At the end of time, you can go here to the Fall of the Outcast, for example. These are all different monoliths with different layouts and different bosses, sort of like in Path of Exile maps and the Atlas. This is by far the biggest end game system and basically what you're going to be involved in at the start now what are you actually farming them other than loot and stuff like that and i will show you how this web actually works you're also farming blessings i will call this out right at the start so at the end you can pick certain permanent buffs to your characters whenever you complete those monoliths whenever you kill the boss basically and they can range from experience to certain drop rates to actual stats like void resistance shred a ton of increased armors these are no joke. You can get a ton of extra stats here, so do not neglect that. So, okay, we're just going to travel to one of these monoliths to kind of check out what's going on right here. So, when you first come in here, you cannot access any other monolith. These paths will open up whenever you kill the boss. So, for example, you kill the boss here, these two pathways will open up. Okay, so if we look here, first, you will only be able to access the normal monolith. You first have to complete... All normal monoliths, not completely true, but you have to complete the last three, the level 90 ones, in order to then go into the middle, activate this thing right here, and then you will be able to do end game monoliths, which are going to be level 100. Now, in order to explain this, I will first choose the normal timeline. So what happens right here is, I already started this one a while ago, apparently. Let's see wherever I started off. Yeah, down here. So this is your starting point and you have this intricate web of reward tiles and these are all of these are basically maps if i went in here i would have to kill a boss i would do a map and a layout so whenever you look at any of these you can hover over them and it says echo reward runes you get a certain amount of stability and then you get extra xp extra rarity yada 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 so these basically accumulate extra rewards the more you do the more rewards you get now you will also see on the top there's like a green bar that lights up whenever you look at these. So if I went here, it says 10 timeline stability up to 22. And that means progress to your quest. That's all that means. So for example, right now I have ransacked camp unlocked. And if I did more of these, I would unlock the second part and then the third part. And in the third quest line, I will then have the boss. And if I kill that boss, I can go to the next monolith. Now, all you really need to think about in these normal monoliths is getting to the boss as fast as possible. You obviously want to level up a character. You want to kill mobs along the way, loot and all the good stuff. But you really want to get to these empowered monoliths that we're going to talk about next. And I'm kind of going to explain the grid as well. So now we're going to get into the legendary one, into the level 100, once you have everything unlocked during your quest progression. I'm kind of going to explain this a little bit. So already accumulated a little bit of a web down here. I'm kind of up there already. But let's go from the beginning. 
So there is a new thing up here called corruption. It starts at 100 in endgame and it goes up and up and up. You can increase it by killing this boss right here, which is called Gaze of Orobis. Whenever you have it unlocked, whenever you have enough stability, whenever you get to a point where you could kill him. For, so for example, if I right now did this right here, it says plus four corruption, bonus corruption, timeline stability. This also depends on how often you kill the boss, all that good stuff. This is all stuff you can explore on your own. But basically what this means is you can increase the difficulty of your encounters for extra rarity and experience. Now there's a few more tile sets here to know and I will actually link you down below to this macro article right here. It is a great summary. There is certain special tile sets that give you certain effects that unveil some parts of the web. So this web goes on forever and ever. Now there's the beacon echo which basically just lights up. So usually for example, if I start down here, I don't really see what's up down here. Let's say a light beacon was here. It would light up the next three or four rewards. Echo of World, we already talked about it. This is basically the mini boss that you can fight to increase your corruption or also decrease your corruption. The further you go out in these webs, for example, if I had a echo right here somewhere, it would probably decrease the corruption because the further outwards it goes, the more it increases. So you can kind of like counterbalance whatever you want of that to make it either easier or harder the vessel of chaos this basically re-rolls all the rewards of tiles that you haven't done yet so what that means is for example i first do all the stuff that i want to do and then i find one of those i do that map and then it will re-roll for example this set ring will become glyphs this glyph right here will become unique wand and then we have the vessel of memory which basically resets your complete web so you can play around with these whatever you want there's some advanced strategies once again i would definitely go to maxwell if you're looking for some of these more advanced ways to get the most out of your currency but yeah as you can see in the background this is for example how a map would look like you basically just jump in you kill monsters along the way very often there is an arrow that will tell you what to do on the right side it also tells you what to do maybe you have to i don't know provoke an ambush so you first have to kill stuff and then stuff is going to jump on you maybe a boss or something like that or there is an event at the end it could also be that you just have to fight wave of monsters but either way it's a pretty basic mapping system and at the end you will then get into a chamber where there is the reward that it said you would get and there is also a chest with random rewards that depends on how many mobs you killed along the way now, other than the model itself we also talked about the bosses here briefly they have certain boss uniques and you kind of have to explore them yourself and some of them are very rare some of them are very common some of them only drop from the higher corruption levels so from the level 100 zone some you can already farm earlier and don't forget about the blessings as well these blessings you also get after completing the boss now number two let's talk about dungeons there are certain keys that you will be dropping that basically lead you to a dungeon if you don't know where these are on the mini map right here which can be quite hard to traverse you only have to right click on the key and it will automatically get you to wherever you need to be so for example on this character i never was farming the soul fire bastion so i would have to go there or the temporal sanctum is down here or the lightless arbor is up here now if you travel there for example we're here at the temporal sanctum right now you can see that there is a big door that you have to put the key into now if you do that enter the sanctum what will happen is it will ask you which tier you want to do you will first have to do tier one tier two tier three tier four and these get a lot harder over time now there's also rotations where these rewards are actually fixed so for example it will tell you today the dungeon boss drops additional exalted weapons. If you do this, additional glyphs and then exalted rings. So you can pinpoint exactly what you want to farm. Now, what are these dungeons actually doing? So this is obviously way too easy for my character right now. But just as an example, I will enter the dungeon. And there is basically a boss at the end as always. Now in order, I will not spoil you what exactly that boss has to do because the boss fight is quite intricate. But what you can do here is you can have a... There's a keybind. So for example, for me, this is the temporal shift ability. Each dungeon has something unique to it. For example, the temporal sanctum dungeon, you can swap between the void world and the real world. So for example, I just came in and I don't see a door. I don't know where to go. Let's press D and well, in this timeline, there is actually a door. So let's go in and uh, let's go here. And it's like, oh, I can't proceed. Maybe I can somehow get in there. Nope, I can't either. Let's move on. And if you swap timelines, you will see there is new enemies, but there is also going to be some doors are opened and some are not. So in order to traverse, you're actually going to have to maneuver through these pretty easily. Let's see if you can go through here. Nope, can't either. Some of these doors will change over time. Some enemy types are easier in one 
harder in the other. Obviously, for me, it doesn't matter right here. Let's swap. So, for example, you can see these two are open in the Void World and so on. All I'm trying to say is there is a lot more going on than just running through a map. Currently, there are three different dungeons. The Temporal Sanctum that you just saw, the Lightless Arbor, and the Soulfire Bastion. They have unique bosses, unique drops, extremely, extremely strong loot-wise. But the bosses take a while to figure out. Once again, no spoiler. And then quickly about the last endgame system, which a lot of you guys will probably not interact with too much. There are these arena keys that you can basically open and... Once again, you can right click on them and then you will see where it is on the map. It's on the champion's gate. And then you can see here the endless arena. This is basically just endless waves of enemies coming at you. For some people, very boring. For some others, this is the way they can kind of quantify how strong their build is. Now, there are some special rewards here and it's not as bad if you, for example, have certain keys. I think they're called arena keys of memories where you already start at 100 waves. So it doesn't take as long to ramp up. Uh, but usually these are used to kind of go for the leaderboards right now i'm in offline so there's no leaderboards but on release this will be something a lot of people will want to do to kind of show off their character and how far they can push now there is obviously strats to this there are certain builds that are way better for example since you are always standing in the middle i mean i can just tell you this right now i can kind of show you so if you go into the arena the endless arena you will just be well you will be greeted by hordes of monsters and there's different layouts but usually you can kind of stand still which if you are doing monoliths for example that is not a thing you have to actually move and the faster you are to the objective the better however if you have a more slower character that is very powerful though maybe you have a lot of defenses a lot of damage you can really use the arena to your advantage and those are usually the ones that are able to push the furthest after you complete five waves you can then continue and you can either abandon it or go further. And then at the end, there will be a big chest. So I think after 10 waves, every 10 waves, it actually stops. I don't do this very often. It's very, very boring to me. However, if I will probably try to push at one point whenever the leaderboards are out. So it is quite cool, but more aspirational. Now then let's quickly go over trading. This needs its own video. I will actually link you down in the description. At this point, I should already have that out. So you can look that up there. But in short... I will tell you there are two different guilds that you can join around about the end of the campaign. One of them is the Merchant's Guild. This one will actually be able to trade. And the other one will be the Circle of Fortune, which will just be self-found. The Way Lost Epoch counters this problem of do I have an auction house? Do I not have an auction house? Do I just go for self-found? Like, for example, Diablo 3. The way they counter that is you decide. If you don't go trade, they will actually give you payoffs, right? You have to farm for favor and it will give you extra enemy drop chance. It will give you extra idols, extra exalted items and so on. The bonuses get pretty crazy so that you get enticed to maybe skip on trading. But if you want to trade, you can still do that. You just need to level up to trade specific items with other people so you can more target and hone in on what you actually want this is a system that is about to get released so it isn't actually out yet for me to test and give you too much info about it other than that i will make like a video going a little bit more in depth on what i think but in general both should be fine and they will be balanced over time it is a great idea for sure now that's about it i hope you enjoyed the video i couldn't include absolutely everything for example i completely forgot there's like a decoy like a training dummy that you can actually fight against see a dps yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of small things that we'll have forgotten that you will kind of explore on your own, but I can't make this video even longer, so I thought I would stop there. But yeah, I cannot wait for 1.0. I really hope it is going to be an absolute banger. The performance is going to be there. People are going to be happy, and uh, we can make a lot of fun builds, and uh, I can post a lot about it. But I uh, hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, since I still don't have a slogan, see you next time.